everyone, and welcome to our highlight show with the best picks of the week. I'm your host, Megan Lee. Here's a look at what we've got in store for you today. Ocean Rider, a Swiss adventurer's sailing trip. Soul Desire, the latest shoe trends for 2018. And Roadrunners, the Lorik Electric Cup Rally on Mallorca. We start off with a man whose fearless sense of adventure has taken him around the world, the Swiss sportsman Ivan Borgnon. Now he rejects creature comforts and modern technology, sleeps out in the open on his boat, and exists on freeze-dried food. While well, Borgnon documented his sailing trip on film, here's a closer look. Ivan Borgnon sailed his sports catamaran around the globe, a journey of 55,000 kilometers with no cabin or GPS. We met up with him in Paris to find out what inspired his voyage. I know it's a stupid idea, but uh, it's my passion since I'm uh, 13 years old. And also when I was young, I did this trip with my parents, but with uh, for sure bigger boat. And uh, I really wanted 30 years after to see uh, what happened during my, uh, uh, when I was young with my life and uh, to understand where I come from. A professional sailor, Yvan Bourgnon has won many prizes and set world records. In 2010, he crossed the Mediterranean in less than 53 hours. Then he decided to embark on his dream to sail around the world. He set out from France on October 5, 2013. After crossing the Atlantic and the Caribbean, he passed through the Panama Canal. During the voyage, he crossed three oceans and 13 seas in all. My idea was to learn, in fact, was to learn every day, to discover how to practice this catamaran alone. I practiced during 30 years, only two people on board. So I really discovered what's happening. He knew from the start that the trip would be extremely dangerous, sailing alone in a sports catamaran. But Bonneau has always loved challenges, even if they don't go as planned. I had a very bad time, I almost died when uh, I capsized because my boat uh, pushed very fast uh, and me, I was in the water and I started to, to have the water inside and it was very dangerous. Bourgnon's experiences now feature on the International Ocean Film Tour. The two-hour program aims to show the oceans in all their diversity and encourage people to take action towards protecting them. It includes six films in all, among them Dolphin Man, a documentary about the legendary French freediver Jacques Mayol, who died in 2001. In 1976, Mayol descended to a depth of 100 meters without an oxygen tank. In the Big Wave Project, some of the world's best surfers ride huge waves off the coast of Portugal near Nazaré. Vamizi showcases the diversity of marine life and the spectacular coral reef of the Karimba archipelago in northern Mozambique. In the ocean rider, the viewer almost feels like they're sitting in the catamaran themselves. During the voyage, storms, cold and severe heat made it difficult for Ivan Bourgnon to sleep. Eventually, he began suffering from hallucinations. I just decided to buy some bread and uh, I just go in the water. And uh, when I was in the water, I said, okay, no, it's not the bakery here. Yeah, I have to go back on the boat. Uh, yeah, because I was so tired. After four days without sleep, disaster struck. His catamaran founded on the rock coast of Sri Lanka. <laughs> it was night time. I, I didn't know where I was. I, could, I couldn't imagine and see the waves, I just see the boat uh, cracks. Police there assumed he was a drug dealer and he was briefly held in jail. Bourgnon had the boat repaired and set off again. On June the 3rd, 2015, he finally ended his voyage off the town of Ouistreham in northern France. He had spent 220 days on the open water. 
It's very simple. I learned that uh, everything is possible when you want it. Huh? That's it. A simple but also very risky rule to live by. But his reward was accomplishing something unique an around the world voyage in a catamaran. Following every fashion trend can be exhausting, so sometimes it's just easiest to focus on one area. Shoes, for example. Well, this year there are so many different styles to choose from, so we picked out the ones that are turning heads the most these days. Weird and wonderful. When it comes to shoes, fashion designers are pulling out all the stops this year. There's something to suit every taste. From sneakers to boots. Shoes have, have definitely evolved and we've moved away from, from those very feminine, very sexy kind of a shoe. But today, if you want to look good, look for a shoe that it makes it a little bit more cool looking because everybody's trying to look cool. Right now we have a lot of shoes that are a mix of styles. Somewhere between cowboy boots, crocs and stilettos. It's an interesting trend. And the shoes are made for walking. Even if they look very feminine, you should still be able to move in them. Boots in every imaginable style are hot this year and are basically all season footwear. For rainy days, there are transparent boots made of see-through plastic like these by Chanel, which come in white or black heels. For spring and summer, there are also tight-fitting boots in mesh fabrics, with or without a peep toe. Supermodel Bella Hadid paired them with a mini dress. And lace-ups are also back. Lace-up boots are also uh, very stylish this season. I think we saw them at Dior and in other shows as well. And that, of course, reminds you a little bit of a can-can boot, but it has a sensual uh, connotation. So it's not something new, and I think designers just think that it's a great style for, for women now. At the other end of the style spectrum, sneakers are no longer just for the gym. The futuristic look is also in with chunky sneakers that could be straight out of Star Wars. They're popular with trendsetters like German fashionista Veronika Heilbrunner and French fashion journalist Karin Rodfeld. Still, there's no shortage of elegance. Kitten heels, pumps with heels less than five centimeters are feminine, but more practical than high heels or stilettos. Whatever the style, though, more and more often the latest footwear is coming adorned with a designer logo. Logos are very much back. In fact, I would say it's logo mania all over again. Another comeback, shoes that perfectly match your outfit and even your handbag, with one element flowing into the next. Sometimes it's even hard to tell where the shoe ends and the pants begin. Others go for a look that's more of a study in contrasts, like this classic by Martin Magella. We should all be a bit more creative. When you look at the 80s and 90s, they had more colors, more shapes. They didn't take fashion so seriously. They had more fun with it. This season's fashion is definitely more about the fun with footwear that's sure to surprise. Time now to head to Mallorca for a modern racing adventure. And for the first time ever, the Loric Electric Cup was held there featuring electric cars built in the style of the 1920s. My colleague Micah Kruger went there and her toughest competitor was none other than Jutta Kleinschmidt, the most successful female racing driver in the world. But as we will see, Micah used common sense to give Jutta a run for the money. Euromax reporter Micah Kruger is on her way to the starting line in the Loric Electric Cup, a very special car race. She's about to test her limits in a 20 horsepower electric car with vintage vehicle appeal. The race will take her through the mountains of Mallorca. 
I've just flipped a little switch in my head and decided, just before the race, not to be afraid. To set my fear aside and just put the pedal to the metal. Micah's co-pilot, Charlie Bosch, constructed the Lorik and gives her a few tips. Here it says 120 kilometers an hour, but we won't go that fast, will we? We could, if we're daring enough. We can go 120 clicks an hour. <laughs> can I tell if the car's already started? It already is. So I can just drive off. To date, Charlie Bosch has built six Lorics. And every car is one of a kind. The bodies are close reproductions of the original Loric models built on Mallorca in the 1920s by the car maker of the same name. Bosch's six Lorics are now going to take part in a race with some well-known drivers. Micah's toughest competitor is Jutta Kleinschmidt, one of the world's top rally drivers. Back in 2001, she took first place in the Paris Dakar Rally, the only woman to have ever won. We're the only women taking part. So here's the question, should we really compete against one another? What do you think? Yes, no. Yes, yes. <laughs> You'll have to pull your socks up, I tell you. OK. And what if I'm just a natural? We'll see about that. You don't get something for nothing. Now let's put the pedal to the metal. go. It's the start of the first stage, a time trial on a stretch of road in the mountains. Although Micah has a minute's head start on Jutta, the rally driver is close to catching up near the finish line. We've got to catch up to them. I've got to step on the gas a bit to pass them again before the finish line, so they know who's boss. Jutta is the clear winner in this first stage of the Lorik Electric Cup, but the women's racing fever quickly cools down. The car's batteries are empty, and it will take an hour to recharge them. Racing electric cars also has its relaxing moments. So the drivers use this forced break to look around Valdemosa's old town and get to know each other a little better over a cup of coffee. But once they're back on the road, they're rivals again. In the second stage, the aim is to achieve an average speed of exactly 50 kilometers per hour. So there's not quite such an adrenaline rush. And suddenly, Micah Kruger discovers the joys of driving an all-electric Lorik. It's really very, very different. You don't have that noise, so you notice lots about your natural surroundings and the smells. You smell the herbs, you hear the birds chirping. The second stage ends up being a tie between the two women. Now it's time for the final stage. This time, the winner will be the first person to reach the finish 200 kilometers away on a single charge. So the competitors will have to drive in an energy-saving fashion. For me, this is a really nice way to drive. Anything else is just stressful. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. So now it's mainly about average driving, and I'm an average driver. So I think I stand a good chance against Jutta, because she's bound to have a heavy foot. And just before the finish, Jutta Kleinschmidt's competitive spirit gets the better of her. To be honest, I'm sick of all this slow, or should I say sensible, driving. I'm going to floor it. Oh, I think I've ever done it. I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! And at the end of the two-day event, each of the women has racked up one victory and one tie. Micah Krüger and Jutta Kleinschmidt celebrate their joint victory. Jutta's really way better than me, but it's great that I've done so well. It's super. It was a great, wild experience, and it was super that we got the chance to really put these cool cars through their paces. And on the way back to the hotel, Maike Kruger just enjoys the Mallorca countryside after her victory. I'm really proud of the Loric and me. It's clear that we make a great team. I'll be sure to come again. 
but maybe not drive quite so fast next time. like fun. All right, next up, a sneak peek into someone's humble abode. And for that, we are heading to Poland. Well, according to the architects, more concrete was used for this house in Warsaw than for any other private home in Europe. Perhaps that was the case, and co a concrete house might be stable, but it doesn't sound very cozy, does it? However, with a design trick, the structure looks as though it is made of wood. Kambionski National Park is just outside the Polish capital, Warsaw. Here you can find a house that looks like it's made of timber, but the facade is actually made of concrete. Dzień dobry. Warm welcome and please get inside my house. 600 tons of concrete went into the house, which is owned by banker Piotr Mielkowski. The goal was to make the house look natural in, in this location. Because the location is surrounded with pine wood and we didn't want to be, you know, uh, intruders uh, or invaders into this place. We wanted to be at home. Concrete plays a major role in the interior as well. The wood-like appearance of the walls gives this normally harsh and cold material an entirely different feel. It's not cold at all. You can touch it, you know. It really feels good, you know. And then if you look at the structure, since it really resembles wood and it really still has contained some wooden parts, it, it is not cold at all. I feel, I feel, you know, this is a very warm material, paradoxically. Mielkowski moved into the 450 square meter house with his wife and three children some eight years ago. At first, he had some doubts about the use of concrete, but not anymore. We can feel that this place probably will outlive most of us easily, and that's why, you know, it. Uh, it it, it brings some sort of stability also. Uh, so I, I like it, yes. The Miyakovsky family enjoys being close to nature. The house has a rooftop terrace and stands on 600 square meters of land. The inner courtyard has a pool. Planning and building lasted three years. It took time to develop the perfect texture and color to achieve the illusion of wood on the concrete surface. We were experimenting quite a lot. Uh, we were happy to find uh, people who were enthusiastic about uh, working with, uh, with uh, concrete. So we found a Danish provider of the cement and uh, a company from Krakow, that is a historic city in the south of Poland, that uh, brought the ingredients, the natural uh, rock, that is used to renovate the facades of the medieval uh, buildings in Krakow. And this is how the mixture was created. A house that has a warm and natural feel, proof that concrete is more versatile than it may appear. You just have to be prepared to experiment. Here in Berlin, you don't have to go very far to experience international cuisine. Well, today, Cambodian food is on the menu from a man who was forced to create a new life for himself in Europe in the face of war and adversity in his native Cambodia. Danny Hawk began working as a cook in East Berlin. And after the fall of the wall, he opened up his own restaurant. Well, he shares a dish with us now, which reminds him of his former homeland. Berlin is my home. The Moabit district of Berlin was once a working class neighborhood. Danny Hawk opened Angor Wat here in 2006. Back then, it was Germany's first Cambodian restaurant. It's just a stone's throw from Bellevue Palace, the official residence of the German president. Danny Hawk gets many of his ingredients in Asian food stores or at the wholesaler. 
The more exotic ingredients can't be found in many grocery stores. I like coming here. It's near my restaurant, so it's a quick trip, and I can get everything I need in my kitchen. These lime leaves have an intense flavor. We use them for seasoning. I love them. <laughs> Danny Hock came to Germany in 1988, when he was just 19. In Cambodia, he grew up with foster parents and an uncle after losing his entire family to the brutal Khmer Rouge regime. He still has contact with his foster father and others back home. Three years ago, Danny and some friends paid a visit to the place in Cambodia where, as a nine-year-old boy, he had buried his own mother. The mayor of the local community also helped him find his mother's grave. And Danny held a Buddhist ceremony in her memory. Although he still feels a strong tie to Cambodia, today Danny calls Berlin home. When I think of home, I remember my parents in Cambodia, when I was little. I miss it a lot. I also miss the food my mother used to cook for me. I wasn't allowed to help, just watch. I remember the food and the scents. Those familiar scents always remind me of home. Amok tray is a traditional Cambodian dish. Amok comes in many different versions. It can be made with fish, usually monkfish, pangasius, or sea bass, or with chicken or tofu. Cambodian food is flavorful, but not as spicy hot as many other Southeast Asian cuisines. is a Cambodian term for cooking curry in banana leaves. Tray means with fish. Steaming helps the dish develop its flavors. Amok tray is served in a bowl on a bed of banana leaves and rice. In Cambodia, we use different vegetables. One is similar to spinach, for example, but not the kind that we know here in Germany. People here don't like it much. That's why we also use other ingredients, like pineapple, bell peppers and mushrooms. But the basic flavor of our amok is the same as you'd get in Cambodia. In Cambodia, shared meals are an important part of the culture. It's a tradition that Danny Hawk wants to pass on. He sees his role not just as chef, but as host too. It's cozy here and I like that. The place just has a very nice feel to it. The waiters are very friendly and happy to recommend nice dishes. It's very homey here. Whenever I long for our food back home, I come here and speak Cambodian with the owner and listen to my music playing in the background. Then I feel like I'm back home. They've adapted some of the dishes to European tastes, but it's always delicious. You can eat a lot without getting fat, too. <laughs> the Cambodian community in Berlin is still fairly small, but many come here to Angkor Wat to enjoy the familiar foods and flavors. <laughs> สำหรับเนี่ย
And with that, it is time to say goodbye. Don't forget you can always keep up with the show by following us on Facebook or on Instagram. For me and the rest of the crew here at Euromax, as always, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again soon.